Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. And I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. These shows are brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation. Today, we're going to be talking about honoring death unrelated to COVID-19. I don't know if you realize it, but in the United States today, there are over 7,000 people will be dying daily. And over the course of the COVID-19 in New York, a little over 7,000 people have died over the full course. So the point that I'm making today and that we want to talk about is the fact that people are dying in the United States where their loss is not being as recognized because of the COVID virus. And we would like to honor those people today and talk about these disenfranchised groups with an expert in the field of grief and loss. Would you like to introduce our guest today, Heidi? Sure, we have a guest here today that we know well. His name is Dr. William Hoy, and we met him at the Association for Deaf Educators and Counselors, where he is on their board of directors. He's given an incredible amount to the grief and loss world. He is a clinical professor of medical humanities at Baylor University and an author and leading expert in bereavement and pastoral care. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Gloria. Great to, be Great to have you on. Well, let's talk about this. I know someone told me that they were feeling unacknowledged and feeling alone in their grief because uh, they had a spouse by a month ago of an unrelated uh, illness to the COVID virus. And it's a difficult time for people, isn't it? It is. Our friend Kim Doka talks about this being disenfranchised grief. Mm -hmm. It is that grief that is uh, socially unacceptable to talk about, or it's grief that is uh, sent underground for uh, because of stigma or just because it's uh, out of the public view. I had a funeral director just this week tell me that he was taking care of a family and the widow uh, whose husband died of um, end-stage heart disease um, said rather plaintively when she was um, making funeral arrangements, I believe was the, the context for the conversation. Well, I guess our, our grief doesn't really count because my husband just died of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And I think there is so much of that sense among people uh, whose deaths were not by COVID-19. And that's not to take anything away from the people whose loved ones are dying every day from COVID-19. It is yeah. simply to acknowledge. I, I agree with you, Bill. And it reminds me of, of a friend that's brother died on 9-11 in a car accident. And she said to me, I have shame around the fact that my brother didn't die in the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. It's almost embarrassing. And I didn't really, she said, because people react in, in a very, like you said, in a disenfranchised way when they hear how he died on 9-11. You know, I'm also thinking about the military because I know we're all, no Bonnie Carroll and the TAPS program. And uh, one of the things that they have become disenfranchised if they didn't die in battle. Mm -hmm. You know, if they had a heart attack or an automobile accident, you know, when they were on leave or furlough or whatever. So, um, you know, it, what is really difficult now is I think we have denied or we disenfranchised grief or we kind of ignore it. Suddenly, it's being thrown in our face with the COVID. I mean, it's quite shocking to see stacks of bodies on, on TV. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's really quite disturbing. It is. You know, it, you're, you're exactly right in, in sort of a humorous way. And I guess this is gallows humor, maybe. But my wife was uh, saying something to me earlier today about the number of, uh, of media interviews that I've done in the last three weeks. And it's more than I've probably done in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I've been quoted in, in uh, newspapers and on uh, Internet and, and news broadcasts all over the country, all over the world, actually. And, and I said, you know, it's funny when you have a narrow enough niche, one day your niche comes in and, mm -hmm. and the, it's a, it's sort of a sad thing to say, but everybody's talking about death and funerals and how do we socially support grieving people right now? So uh, you're right. Yeah. 
So how do we? I think there are a couple of things that I'm really concerned about. Uh, one of them is we do not need to punt rituals down um, into the late summer or early fall to have. Um, I think we have to find creative ways to do rituals now when they are contemporaneous with the grief, mm -hmm. uh, with the death. We, we don't need to punt them down the road. Now, I think there's some creative things to do. For example, when a person dies now, um, I, I uh, heard just this week of a, a funeral provider in the upper Midwest, I believe, and they were holding um, parking lot funerals. And so uh, the immediate family gathers, you know, their maximum of 10 inside the chapel, everybody six feet apart, um, doing, doing that piece. And then through Facebook Live, everybody sitting in their automobile, all the friends sitting in their car out in the parking lot with their phones in their hand, watching the funeral inside on their phone. Oh. Then when the family exited the chapel to bring the casket out to the hearse, everyone in the parking lot turned on their headlights and oh. then they all followed in solidarity in an old fashioned funeral procession. They went past the bereaved home and the business workplace of the, of the deceased and then on to the cemetery where because they were outdoors as long as they stayed, you know, uh, a distance apart, they could kind of gather. Now, if you have a lot of people, they're going to gather over a large circle. But, but my point is, we can find some creative things to do. And I believe that will be much more supportive than saying, well, we're just going to have a little private gathering now, and then we'll do the real funeral later on. We need the support now in that immediate aftermath of the death. The other thing I saw is instead of having a line where people go up and, and say, we're so sorry for your loss, the family went out, the family that had the loss went out in their front yard and got lawn chairs and lined up there and then people drove past and honked. Yeah. And that was kind of like a virtual hug in a way and a virtual support. Indeed. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, absolutely. Did, Lots of creative things to do. Yeah. Um, you know, my son's um, date of his death was April 2nd. Mm -hmm. And I thought, um, that, you know, even it's been many years, but I think it's important, particularly now to honor those moments. Don't to let them pass just because, you know, you're not together. One of the things um, I did was texted all the kids and said, and, you know, other family members and said, tell us a fun story that you remember about Scott. And then I will, we're, I'm going to lift a glass with my husband at seven o'clock you know, tonight, and uh, if everyone would like to do that and then share the, the memories, because it's been a long time for us, so the memories are pretty happy and remember those happy memories. So don't, don't let it pass, you know? You know, you can acknowledge them. I think it's really important to- And, and the other thing is, Mom, there's a pandemic going on, but it doesn't mean that our lives totally come to a screeching halt. Sometimes people feel guilty about, okay, I've got rituals and there's Passover and Easter and people are dying and I need to acknowledge that, you know, like Bill said, we can't wait, you know, until fall to acknowledge what's happening right now in our lives and to, to give it validation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Heidi, uh, you've had COVID and you're just recovering. The worst part of having COVID, and I've had it for three weeks and I'm at the end, and it's just been like a, a bad cold and flu combined. But the worst part was me getting in my head and being terrified that I was going to get really bad and stop breathing because I kept seeing on the media that that was happening in some cases. So I was my own worst enemy in that case. The worst case scenario didn't happen. And I think for most people it doesn't, but because there's all these media images, you are terrified that you're gonna end up in you know, one of these big body bags that they're showing. I don't know, Bill, what is your thought about this? Well, uh, you know, I love, I love the, I, I love living in a, in a place where the media has full reign and, and, and free press to, to talk about what's going on. The downside to that is that there is no rain and mm -hmm. therefore um, uh, images can be shown just um, without, without regard to the impact they might have. And the problem is the media is not, you know, the, the journalists are not epidemiologists. They don't deal in the numbers. They, um, they report uh, numbers of deaths. And, and every day, it's like those of us who are old enough to remember when Walter Cronkite every evening on the evening news mm -hmm. reported the body count from Vietnam. But they're just numbers. They're, um, and, and as Heidi started out the top of the show saying, 
you know, if we have 240,000 deaths in the United States this year, which nobody in the public health uh, uh, circles believe now that we will, the number down now is down to around 60 or 80,000. But if we had 240,000 this year, that would only raise the, the total number of deaths in the U.S. by 8%. We have 2.8 million people die in the U.S. every year, year in, year out. Uh, more people, uh, if 240,000 die, COVID would be no higher than the number three cause of death. If the number is really um, 60,000 or 70,000, it, it will barely make it into the top 10. And wow. That's not, the, that's not the image we're getting when we see all these bodies stacked up in mm -hmm. refrigerator trucks in, in New York. Of the people that die in the United States, 90% of them are age-related. And, and they're going up a little bit because we have an older population. We take care of our population. But I'm going to have to say one thing here. I personally, I'm 80 years old, and I personally did have some problem. I am in very, very good health. And I have problems having my grandkids feel that they could kill me. You know, that, that if they go out and uh, I'm sheltering with a couple of grandkids, they, I think they're finally getting over it because I had to say to my senior in high school, you know, if I die, if I get COVID, you didn't kill me, please. Right. You know, I've been around other places, but the fear, you know, that it does for the younger generation also, you know, is very difficult. And the fact is, I am older and eventually I will die. Let's well, 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 I've got to be the other side of that. And I agree. I hear what you're saying. And, and even if you did get it, it doesn't mean that they gave it to you. It's interesting having it because there's a lot of shame mm. and, and embarrassment that is not talked about. And, you know, I got it. And I didn't realize I was COVID positive and I flew across the country COVID positive in a middle seat. And I'm going to say that because that was the reality and had no idea. So, you know, now I wonder who did I expose, who has it, you know, you start getting into all this shame and guilt, et cetera, that you kind of need to work through also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because the reality is we probably all when we have the flu, we probably do expose people unknowingly, mm -hmm. but we don't usually carry all the guilt. And I think the difference this time is that that there is a lot of uh, a lot of sort of community free floating anxiety mm -hmm. about COVID and coronavirus, and and that's largely because it's unknown. And I realize that. And I'm not I am not for one minute putting down the, the importance of this or how serious it is. I'm not at all comparing it to the flu. What I am saying is that we have sort of, it seems to me we've lost perspective, but the problem with losing perspective is how it disenfranchises the experience of loss for everybody else. And yeah. to me, that's the travesty in this. The, the older adults who are dying alone in nursing homes who had they don't have a COVID diagnosis, 90, way over 90% of them don't, and they're still dying alone. It's hard for people being alone, especially when they're in hospice. It's very short-sighted. It's bad for the, for the person who's dying, and it is really bad for the people who survive. We will be, you know, those of us who do bereavement are going to be sweeping up the relational pieces from the way we've handled this, not for a couple of years, but probably for generations. Yeah. Uh, we see the we see the ongoing effects after Katrina in New Orleans mm -hmm. in a city that has nowhere nearly recovered from that, and that's been 15 years. And this is something that is much much more broadly spread, and uh, many more people involved. I, I think we're going to be dealing with this uh, for the rest of my working career and probably beyond. One of the things she said and is don't let the moment pass by that recognition moment of the loss, try to acknowledge it. I want people to know that when they listen to this show that some of those feelings that they're feeling, guilt, shame, whatever is normal, the sadness, you know, is, is normal to what's going on right A now. Anger, I think, people, I think people are angry. Or, yeah, depression, whatever. So. Could you give uh, me, as I'm watching this and I've had a recent loss, can you give me a few tips, some things that I might do to 
get myself on the path a little bit? Sure. Uh, write things down. Um, we, we underestimate the value of journaling in our society. And right now, many of us have a lot of time on our hands. It takes a lot longer to write something than it does to say it. So now we have the luxury of time. Let's write. Let's, uh, you know, you can order a journal on Amazon or buy blank paper or get out your grocery receipt and write on the back. I don't care. Just write. Write down, um, here are some things I'm thinking. Here are some things that are going through my mind, my heart that I'm struggling with. Here are the things I wish I could have said. A second thing is make sure that you take care of your physical well-being. Um, you know, one thing that is particularly problematic anytime there's a virus that's percolating around in the society is that if people are immunocompromised, they are at a, at a higher risk. That's part of what we've been talking about with coronavirus and COVID. Well, the problem is when we get, uh, when we're not eating well, we're uh, eating too much junk food, comfort food, we like to call it. We're eating, we're not, uh, probably not exercising adequately. We become immunocompromised very, very quickly. Mm. Grief is a high stressor. So make sure you're taking good care of your physical self. Drink lots of water. Mm. Uh, make sure you're getting uh, plenty of fruit juice and vegetables and and uh, maybe a, a few fewer Snickers in my time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then I think the third thing is to really reflect on what this means. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, of course, a particularly holy season, both for members of the Jewish community and for Christians around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, to think about um, this season is a particularly difficult time to have a loss. And yet, um, if you think about it, Passover, um, Holy Week and Easter, those, those holidays have loss all woven into them. Mm -hmm. And they are a way for us to think about the ultimate meaning of loss. And I, I think that's a particularly poignant thing to do at this time uh, when I'm experiencing a loss right now. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. Such good advice. You know, I love the idea about writing everything down. And later on, uh, you may want to talk with your pastor or friend or, you know, whatever about some of the thoughts you had during this time and, you know, kind of follow it all the way through. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today and for all the lovely things you do for everyone. Well, thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Gloria. It's an honor to get to be with you and blessings on you and the great work you guys are doing. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for acknowledging and validating everybody's loss. You know, the worst loss that can ever happen to us is the one that's happening to us right now. So our hearts are with everybody that is going through any kind of loss right now. And thank you for giving us some hope and some ideas of how to handle, you know, our own situations. And thanks everybody for joining us today. And Heidi and I hope you'll visit us at opentohope.com. And we always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.